first off, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I'm Lavanya from Test Sigma, and uh, today we'll be delving into API testing, uh, some best practices, strategies, and how you can uh, get familiarized uh, with the topic. And uh, API testing is based on protocols and standards, and for a beginner, it may sound overwhelming uh, to begin with. So uh, our speaker today is an expert in this area. Uh, rest assured, uh, she would help decode API testing intricacies in the webinar. And in case uh, we do run out of time, we'll keep a note of uh, all your queries and make sure to address them and uh, share with uh, you. Before we start, I want to do a little housekeeping. Uh, if you have any questions during this uh, discussion, please type them into the Q&A of uh, your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up uh, during the presentation and we'll also have some time for questions in the end. Um, now, uh, we also want to give you an overview of Test Sigma. So um, Test Sigma is an end-to-end -end software test automation platform that simplifies your entire testing life cycle and it lets you scale effortlessly without compromising on speed, quality, and delivery. So Test Sigma is low code and ensures enough flexibility is provided to tech and non-tech uh, teams uh, uh, for meeting the testing requirements. So on a single platform, Test Sigma supports uh, web, mobile, APIs, et cetera, where you can create tests in plain English and uh, you can run them on massive real devices cloud. Uh, it's also very easy to get started with Test Sigma. You may also want to check out our tool at testsigma.com. Uh, in today's uh, session, uh, here's a high level of what we'll be covering, but there's more. Uh, we talk about APIs, their importance, API testing and uh, UI testing, how it is different. We'll address the debate uh, surrounding uh, these two, uh, how we can test APIs, uh, a, a walkthrough of how API testing can be done, various types of API architectures and uh, types. Cool. So um, just before you start, I just wanted to introduce you to everybody who's here. Um, it is our absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Saumya to everybody uh, who's an API testing enthusiast. Uh, many of you might already know Saumya as she actively participates in the testing community. She hosts meetups and shares her insights through interesting talks, infographics, and blogs. Uh, she's a quality engineer at Lido and loves API testing and staying up to date with everything latest in test. Um, so let's talk about API, Samya. Yeah, APIs are monsters, if I can just put in a simple sentence for many of us. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's it's overwhelming for somebody who's coming across for the very first time. It comes across like dry, very cold, giving a cold stare and shoulders at you and just not being friendly. But APIs are not really that. They are sweethearts, if you ask me. The most stable, hard process, if there is anything in testing, that would be APIs. So API is nothing but in a layman terms is a bunch of code written to perform a particular function or an action. And most, most likely it's a crude actions plus an information reading type of uh, a function which it performs. And it's an acronym for application programming interface. It's an interface, which means it's gonna connect two things, takes an information from one side, reaches to the other, processes it, gets the information back to the person who asked the question. And a very famous example that goes in the market is you go to a restaurant, you look at the menu, and then you're a client in the restaurant. You look at the menu and say, hey, you know what? I want an ice cream. And then there's a person who's a bearer who comes to you and say, oh, all right, I'm going to get this. But what flavor, what thing? And he takes some queries and questions from you, goes to the backstage into the kitchen and gets the ice cream. And the kitchen is something like a server who's going to prepare, the chef is going to prepare um, customize it for you and then send it back. It's exactly the same thing what an API does. And um, it basically performs a function. But with regards to the RESTful APIs, the advantage is it follows the HTTP protocols. And anything that you see as a part of HTTP, which is hypertext transfer protocol, is, is part of the REST. And all the verbs or the functions or the methods that you come across, which can which can be a little overwhelming or too much for a beginner or a starter, uh, which we will go through anyways today in our webinar, uh, simply follows all the protocols that a HTTP follows. So you don't have to learn something new of, of all um, when it comes to a RESTful APIs. So that's that's the answer about an API. It's simply a bunch of code. It is supposed to perform a function. Right. It can be on a DB, it can be between microservices, it can be uh, between two functions, or it can be any of these things. So it performs functions between two, what can I say, resources would be the right 
the right place to start. So I guess your natural question would be, what's the importance of API and why okay. we should stress over it, right? So I took over a yeah. question on, on my side. Um, so I, I come across this question very often that people ask, what's the future of testing? Um, where do we go from here? What, what is my role? But I am not here to tell you, you know, you can become a senior engineer or something will, so something is going to, uh, AI is going to take away somebody's role. But I would say that at the bottom line, if you hold API as a skill in, in your career, be it you're a developer or a tester or a product manager, this is going to take you a long way. This is gonna. This is the place. This is the way which is gonna take a long stride. Okay. Why I say this? Because all the innovations that you speak about today, metaverse, IoT, uh, be it the new banking um, technologies that we see on a day-to-day -day basis, um, all of these things, even cryptocurrencies, they are seeing a lot of innovations in the market simply because it is enabled through APIs. So the heartbeat of all these innovations is API. No matter which industry you go, which domain you go, be it healthcare, sales and distribution, CRM, or any of the startups you go, it doesn't, um, no conversations goes unturned without an API. So the future is API. No matter what role you are in, even if you are in a knowledge management expert who writes technical documentations, and if, if you don't come across an API, I think there is a limitation somewhere as part of your career. So it is that important. And that can redefine your entire career graph. So that's like a stepping stone for you. If I can say for the next 10 years, API makes the base and foundation. So um, uh, what do you think, uh, like how, how do you think can we test these APIs? How relevant are these? Um, do we have to follow some manual procedure or all the, do we need to automate these? So um, when, it, when it comes to the executions of an API, there is a variety of ways depending on the maturity of the team, um, how good the collaboration is and how, uh, how comfortable are you you're dealing when dealing with APIs. So the more uh, the skilled you are, the more the better options and choices you always find when it comes to testing. And we, we make use of automation just to make your life a little more simple. Um, to run the same redundant task all over again. Uh, that's why we make use of test automation. But otherwise, there is always a cognitive and a human mind which is which goes behind when you have to churn out a new use cases, understand a scenario, come up with some um, um, if-else-then scenarios, things like that. So when it comes to why testing an API, usually there is this is understanding always which is set in the market that UI is flaky and unstable and it has a reason because it's a first touch point for a customer and that will be the first thing which will be changing on a day-to-day -day basis i may introduce a button i may change a drop down screen tomorrow i may decide to introduce instead of drop down go for a radio button so you you may have to constantly change this platform and the, because to serve the present needs so that there is a good interaction where the user experience comes into the picture so with regards to api everything is behind the scenes and once you make a table design, once you come up with a functionality, when you come up with uh, something, an idea of implementation of a business function, it's stable. You, we don't change taxation laws every day. We don't change an implementation of a customer relationship management every day. It's a well thought through and put. And okay. if you base your tests on these APIs, so pretty sure that you are betting on the right side and you don't have to keep changing it. Will there be enhancements on APIs? Yes, there will be enhancement, but that doesn't mean it stops the execution of the previous functionality which is delivered. It will always be the stable part and then the enhancement. So now as a tester, for me, this base remains the same and I just have to check that little delta part where I keep adding new tests and creating new scenarios for the regular yeah. execution. So that's the reason why you need to test APIs because it gives you a stable platform and more near to the code. You can find the bugs at its source. So right, that is exactly what sets it apart from uh, uh, UI testing, yeah. right? Yeah. So um, uh, I also wanted to touch upon the uh, difference in testing external and internal APIs. Um, uh, can you elaborate on those? So when it comes to API, it's a gamut of activities. It has grown beyond its cocoon, what it was 20 years ago. And APIs are not something that we have been seeing um, now. It's not something that is recent. If, if I can start the story, it starts with RPCs, you know, remote procedural calls. That's where I started. Like back in 2008, 2009, we used to do RPCs 
we used to write a code for RPCs, you know, um, to communicate with the server, with the local servers that we have. And from then on, it has moved. It has taken an entire spectrum of growth, like then introduced SOAP from Microsoft, then came the RESTful APIs. Now is era of GraphQL, most web applications and uh, uh, mobile applications are making use of GraphQL simply because of its simplicity and it is less chatty as compared to REST, RESTful APIs. So people who are listening to the first time about APIs, we will touch upon the point why RESTful APIs are more chatty as compared to GraphQLs. Um, but right now, if you see, most web applications are making use of RESTful APIs simply because of its simplicity and the way it can be easily decoded when the response is sent. When it comes to the API, um, we can differentiate it based on the protocols, like just I mentioned, uh, SOAP, RPC, gRPC, RESTful API, GraphQL. These are some of the ways in which you can architect them, the API based on the API specification, and then goes ahead, depending on the business level, like it's an open API or a public API or a shared API or a private API or an internal API. So this is, this is mostly about from the business layer, how this is represented. Um, and uh, the level of conversation decides what type of APR we are talking, but most likely when you're within a development team talking to a technical people, it most likely 90% of the times will be in terms of the specification and uh, the way uh, it is architected. Is that what you wanted to ask, Lavanya? Exactly, exactly. Uh, I just want to uh, add this follow-up question that we received. Uh, can you give an example of uh, you know, an internal or a public API? An internal or a public API, for example, you're uh, developing in your company, you're developing, let's say, for example, you're in a banking and you're developing applications where, where you want to take a credit card data and update it in the back end for some sales purpose, right? Now, in order to achieve this, you have an API being done where in the UI, a form will be given where user can enter the details along with the credit card details with a save button or a create button. And then as soon as submit or create is clicked, the whole bunch of data is bundled in a form of a JSON or any other format that, that is put in place in, in coding. And the whole bundle is taken inside to the server. So this is this is, can be seen only within your application and only you can see it. Uh, any uh, normal person or outside person outside your organizations will not be able to see because this is mostly for internal structuring of this application. These are the internal APIs. Now, what are the external APIs? or uh, shared API. So these are the things where you may have to integrate between two different applications. Like I am having um, a retail, a cupcake shop, and I want to have a payment method. But when I do payment, I have to integrate with the, some payment portals. Now that is an external applications and I have to integrate it. So the only way that they allow me to communicate with their payment portal is making use of this API, which is exposed to me. And Having said that, it's not simply exposed. They say, when you communicate, you have to send me this token. You have to send me this secret key so that I know it is you who is communicating with me. So this type of API mostly works with the trust and where these tokens and authorizations concepts come in. Um, and so these are the external APIs, which is mostly used for the integration scenarios. Did I answer your question? Right, yes, you did. I just had one follow-up question, Samia, which is uh, like, is there a difference in testing these uh, both external APIs and internal APIs? Most likely not. Most, most of the time it's not. Um, but there can be some scenarios which will be slightly different as compared to the internal APIs. Now, what happens in an internal APIs, everything is within your ecosystem, your own firewalls, your own VPNs, your own load balancers, everything is like internal. You don't face much of an issue with regards to headers, you know, and the information that is shared. But the moment you go external and you have to communicate with outsiders, then the headers become more strict. And most likely you will come across the course issue, which is cross-site scripting uh, CORS uh, issues, which you have to take care. Because when the information is sent from that API to yours, and if it is not allowed, you most likely see web applications fall apart or it doesn't come back. You would have seen these classic cases of you're trying back button, but then it gives you 404, simply because it's showing a course error in your um, development tool if you see in the web application. So there is not much of a difference except for few authorization and the way you authenticate yourself when you communicate and the traversal back to your application. So those scenarios are handled slightly from a scenarios perspective, but otherwise 
you apply pretty much the same testing techniques for external APIs okay. too. Right. Thank you. And uh, in the next slide, maybe we can uh, talk about how APIs communicate. Yeah, so uh, this is a classic example that you have seen, and this is like bursting out there in the internet. You find everywhere. Client is nothing but a person like me. But when I say me, I cannot talk in a zero and one bit language or a browser language. That's why it's usually represented with a, either a laptop or a mobile or a tablet, whichever mode of end user application you're going to use it or handheld devices that becomes a client, a person who has a question or who's in need of information or someone who's looking forward to perform an action, they become a client. And then there is this API, which is like behind the scene, which nobody can see, boo, the demon, who's going to take all this information behind without even your knowledge, uh, complying to the HTTP protocols to the server. And then there is like the server who performs a quick uh, check of the information if it's available, not available based on that, then it's going to nicely package it as a part of a response and send it back to the client, which you see on your screen. And this entire activity happens within a few seconds. And uh, you don't even realize that there's so many things happening in the in, in the in the background. But yeah, these things happen within a in a split second, and you get to see all the information back onto your screen uh, with all the relevant details that you requested from the server. Cool. So let's go to the next one. Uh, this one is pretty interesting because um, I wanted to uh, bring in this information to so many people. When you talk about an API at a heart, everything starts with API specification. And who decides this? It's mostly your product team if, if, uh, and your um, architect, whoever it is, domain architect or a principal architect, I don't want to name it, but it's most likely your tech team, especially the seniors who are there in, in the architect positions are the one who will be deciding based on the type of business, the type of customers, the type of infrastructure you have, the cost that you would like to put on the budget. There are so many uh, ingredients that's put and churned out and then they decide, okay, let's go with the RESTful API. No, I think GraphQL is right. So they are the one who will be deciding the type of specification, API specification that they want to create. And API specification is nothing but a rule, a rule set, how you want to perform. Like, for example, in a layman terms, if you, if you take dance, either you can do Bharatanatyam or you can do ballet, you can do tango. Everything is a dance form, but all these dance form have its own way and own facial expression. And when I, when I move my hands or body in a particular way, it means it signifies something, some message. Likewise, in API specification. So you have so many dance uh, uh, ways, but which way you would like to perform is something that your team architects is going to decide on behalf of you. Once this is decided, everything else pans out. Uh, based on the API specification is when API designs are made, we talk about and also about documentation. Depending on what type of design, how we are designing all the HDDs, you come up with the documentation of these APIs. Initially, there will just be a framework of how many APIs we may need, what are the types of API. We cannot get into nitty gritty details, but it's most likely our whole application may look like this. We may need these many number of endpoints doing these functions on a very granular, on a very high level. And then when it comes to the source code, actual implementation, we start refining it step by step, step by step, creating every API, and then identifying what this API does. Does it read? Does it write? Does it delete? Does it put or patch? What does it do? What it is supposed to do? For all of these actions, a bunch of code is written, and you know the action or the method or verb is also associated with this function so that you know what this performs. And of course, when the source code is developed, we also do testing. And then testing pans out with so many activities, right from you sitting in front of your laptop, spending time analyzing, understanding, coming up with the test scenarios, breaking it down to the use cases or the test scenarios based on the user personas and testing it. Then the role of test automation testing, which gets integrated to continuous integration, not just testing, but also your source code, which gets integrated, which after the green signal goes to the release. So you see there is an entire life cycle of an API that happens within an organization and not just one person is associated. You see there are multiple departments having their hands in getting this live or getting this working. Uh, and then once it's all developed, 
There is also um, other form of peripheral tests which happens with the security. Now, somebody can question, will security come in the end? No, it will be right at the starting. When they design itself, security will be part of the mind. It should be part of their mind. They have to design the APIs, keeping security at the heart of the application, and then also document about those security. However, the deep security tests are also performed when the source code is developed. Uh, observability and monitoring is something that is done by SREs in your team who are site reliability engineers who keep an eye if these APIs are working, are they healthy, is, some, is there any problem, are the well-formed um, well load is being put on it, is it breaking down at any time. These are some things which ops team usually takes care. So this is in nutshell. Okay, so there can be beyond this, which I'll not be able to put it in a simple screen, but if you see an API lifecycle has like so many activities going on um, at any given point in time. So I'll move to the next slide. Yes. The main question, how do you test an API and how do you begin? Like on a typical day, how do you test API somewhere? Um, on a typical day, um, so uh, I, I start my, um, I usually go to the uh, documentation. That's where the source is everything. Even before I reach out to a developer to asking uh, questions, I first go uh, to uh, my documentation part and I see the API documentation. I read it. I see how they have structured. There will be schema provided. There will be an example response body provided. There will be the list of um, uh, responses. Maybe what I can do is also share you Okay, so I hope my screen is still shared and you guys can see my screen. Yes. And uh, so this 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 will be uh, this is an example. This is not a production relevant API. Is what you're seeing is an example. Swagger is a tool which is most likely used in many organizations for documentation purpose. As the name specifies, it gives you all the information about the number of endpoints we have, what it is going to do. Like for example. I have a bunch of uh, APIs which performs something about cities and the airports in that city. So you see it says get and then it performs some action. It most likely gives me 200 if it is success, how a body looks, what goes into a body and what is the response content type, what are the parameters I can pass to this and most likely what are the error status. So this is, this is my first thing, this is my Bible. I come here and I read it first and if something is not really clear to me, I get back to my developer, hey, you've given me this, but I'm not really sure what a, what a parameter dot key is. What is it a string? Is it an ID? And then I build my conversation. Then I make a choice for tool in which I have to run or execute this. However, Swagger also gives you um, uh, an opportunity to execute this, but it is a lot of pain. You have to each time build a request and send a request to see the responses. So we avoid it and use more official testing tools maybe example like test sigma where we can test the apis uh, and add our tests regularly into it and can be automated as well um, and then of course then goes the bug life cycle then chasing the developers to fix it then having a conversation with product manager saying hey this is important why why is this not taken just fix it and then the whole gamut of quality engineering activities happen so that's how my usual day goes Great. okay now back to um, the slide yeah this was the thing. Right. So I also wanted to add to this, like, um, you know, it it could be a it, it could be quite overwhelming for a beginner to memorize parameters and points. So yeah. how do we start? And like, do you think it, we should memorize the st status codes and how does that work? No, uh, you shouldn't be actually memorizing any of the status codes. So when you begin, you will not remember anything. However, there is some golden rules that we follow. See, whenever something is success, it's always 200, okay? But there will also be 201, which means it's a create. So if you see the Firefox or the Mozilla uh, HTTP codes, if you go and check, anything that starts with one and up to 199, it's informational message. There's nothing that you may have to do. And anything with 200s range, which starts with two is a success. So you may have 200, 201, and your developers may create their own success messages with a specific status codes. In that case, you may have to familiarize yourself because that is pertaining to your company and it's not prevalent in outside market. So you may have to be aware of, of it and you have to ask your developers. But otherwise, if you go on to the Mozilla Firefox and then look at the HTTP codes, it's a standard, same is reused. Anything in 400s is considered an error. Um, anything in 500, 
is considered an error from the server side. You asked an information, but server couldn't give you like 503 is a very famous server unavailable. And 400s are client type of issue. Who's a client? It's me. And the way I am asking question can be wrong. So any of those errors will be shown in 400s, 401, 401, 404. These are some of the um, day-to-day statuses that you see. So when you start first, you may have to frequently go back to the documentation to test. But one week down the line, some of these frequently seen statuses register your mind. And then a month down the line, everything just memorizes and you see and you'll quickly be able to recognize what this is. Like for example, 302, it's a permanent redirection. Oh, okay, so this URL is redirected to something else. So that's how we pick up. But initially when you start, yes, you have to go back to documentation and check. Can you also see it uh, uh, practically, Samya? Uh, can you show us how it would look like? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good idea. Thanks, Lavanya. So what we'll do is, let's take a very simple example of a normal day. Uh, okay. So this this is uh, this is the API which I'm interested to test, and uh, I will copy paste this API into my test sigma. So before I come here, what I did, I just came here, created my own test plan. So I have a set of E2E tests already automated as a part of this uh, test suite, but now I want to add the API test as well so that I can bunch up and put everything in one place. I don't have to keep hopping between multiple tools to do UI testing and then API testing. So I have bunched up everything I put here and you can see this is my test plan, but let me go to the test suite. Um, and then you can see a list of APIs that I have already added. Like again, this is not a production relevant API. This is uh, for the session. So please don't go in search of these APIs. And so let's take a, a simple one, which is a get requests. So we'll do a get cities now. Okay. Here, here you are. So in any workbench, when you go, most likely you get to see this same visual or visibility when it comes to RESTful APIs because everything is standard. So nothing out of a blue or something new anybody can do. Most likely you see some verbs here. These are also called methods. Method is a function. What do you want to perform? You want to get some information. Post means you want to create any information. You want to put or patches, you want to update something or you just want to delete anything. So you've got to tell. Why we have to do this is because I'll come to that point. But the next important thing that you have to observe here is this is called a URL, which is Uniform Resource Locator. Like I said, RESTful APIs follow HTTP protocols, which means it just, it just works on internet. So just like how you have URLs for your shopping website or any of your banking website, APIs will also have because they are stored in a particular place and it has to be accessed. And that is done making use of these URLs. Most likely when you're creating an entire test plan or working within a company, this URL remains constant or same for the entire bunch of APIs or the application that you're trying to create. So that is the reason why they are called a base URL. Uh, and because it's, it's remaining the same for the entire test plan, you know, and then you may see something like this, which we call it as endpoints. So if I can give you an analogy, see, this is your home, right? This is your home, your entire home, and you have like six to seven rooms. And each room has a specific function. You have a kitchen, you have a bathroom, you have a master bedroom, you have a guest room, you have a kid's room, you have a playroom. I don't know. I'm just making it up. And then you have a laundry room. So many rooms available. And then each room has a specific function to perform. So this is just like that. So when I say cities, it performs a, uh, it, blah, blah, blah. It performs a specific function, yes. So that is why it is called an endpoint. And this is very important. At any point in time, you miss this endpoint, you will not be able to execute anything. So right now, this is my base URL. This is the room I want to enter. And what I want to do is to fetch an, some information about that city. I simply just go send. Okay, something happened in the background in a minute second, and then just, I got so many information to me, which was thrown. Now I don't know what I have to do with it. This is why I say APIs can get cold. It can be scary. It can be scary so many times and not many people like dealing with this, you know, but if I break down one thing at a time, what you see here is something called a response. And the response is what your server has bundled up and sent you the information based on the request. I am interested in the city. And then you can see something is repeated over and over again in a particular format. And this format is called a JSON format, which is JavaScript object notation. 
This is a standard format that you pretty much get to see in most of the RESTful APIs, which goes between a key and a value. And if you see in this particular response, a key and a value is repeated, which means I'm getting a set of response so with the ID and a name, airport name, and the abbreviation of that airport. So you see, so many information has passed on to me, which is great. But now what should I be doing? It's not just this. There's something more which has come along with this. But OK, this is good. I know what the method is. I know what the endpoint is. I executed it. What next? So the generic thing, the first thing anybody has to see is the status. So status, like we just discussed, this is a standard set of output that is usually linked for the standard responses. You may have some customized responses, which you have to check with your development team. But usually, when a GET request is executed successfully, you get to see 200. So the first step as a test engineer, they always do is to just go and check whether it is 200 or something else. If it is something else, then it's a point of conversation with your team. If it is 200, then most likely I would like to automate it and then save it that whenever I run this so that this test can be performed automatically. I don't have to keep coming to the status tab and checking whether it is 200 or not. So there is an easy way of doing it. Um, so with the Test Sigma tool, because it's a low code, no code tool, it helps you. In fact, I can say it's a no code. But I use the word low code because there are add-ons and integrations available. So if you're good in Java, you can also code something and customize it. But however, for the benefit of everybody, you can simply go here, do an add verification. It just adds. I have already added, but then just for showing purpose, this is a status code. And then I'm checking whether it's 200 or not. So let's, what we'll do, we'll, let's remove that and let's make it 201. Update it. And then kind of like, execute this and check what happens. Okay. Um, status. I am, uh, yeah. So verify response body. So you can check all the responses in here. Um, so in this way, I can keep adding tests. Now the other, the other test can also be I may want to check something specific about uh, this. If there is a second body, like for example, here, the second one should always be Washington DC with the ID two. Now, again, I can simply come back to the outline, see where the output is, which is this, and can simply either store it as a variable for further purposes, or I can simply add a verification into it, which I've already done in my verification. So it, most likely takes this path, which is a JSON path of your response, which can be found directly in the outline. And then I am checking whether this expected value is three or not. So you can keep building your tests based on the scenario that you have uh, and keep adding more tests possible. This is simple working of a get, but life is not this simple, right? But this is how you have to start and then build your verifications for more details. And then you have create and then you have port, which has more other information. I guess we'll be talking about that in the future slides, Lavanya, but uh, is this is this helpful? Sure, yes. Okay. You're good. Enough. We'll have a demo in the end, right? So this yeah. should cover. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to um, uh, ask you, Samia, on that slide, yes. Um, so we do exhaustive testing on APIs. Can we like do, uh, you know, checks, health checks or static checks of APIs? Yeah. Absolutely. So there are two ways you can do a static check. One is with your swagger, but it's a little pain when you go to the documentation tool to check the statuses. But the other way is also when you're doing your end-to-end -end tests. Um, let's take some example. I don't know. Uh, let's go to test sigma. Um, and then Okay, so this is the place I want to test something, whether my documentation is working or not. So most likely, I am a tester who's testing Test Sigma's documentation website, and then I am performing some actions to check the functionality is working or not. The other way is just go to your inspect tool, go to your network, and then I just want to see if tutorials part is working. When I click, there are so many network calls. Oh, that's not good. I found a bug for you, Lavanya, which is great. But okay. This is a, uh, okay, that's not a very good planned one, isn't it? Okay, okay so no. uh, let me let me remove this. 
rerun this one so that I can show you. Um, maybe we'll go to the test management. Are some of you laughing behind the scenes? Because you're not shared your uh, camera, I will never know. But this is a fun moment. I'm liking it. Uh, this was not planned. So you see something like XHR. This is a good place that you check whether this URL is working fine or not. This, these may be used for several purposes. Sometimes we'll use it to add some Google tags for um, analytics purpose uh, to tracking your user behavior. Then you may have to check if that tags are working or not. So every time you don't want to go somewhere to dynamically add a test. So you simply come here, look for that XHR, check if the headers are fine, if the status code is fine, if you're receiving uh, the right response. Is this a way you should be receiving the response? Is your response headers right? You can have the re request header, but most likely when we are decoding a response, we go to the response headers and we check whether the response headers are right. You know, mm -hmm. then we check whether the cookies is fine. There are some cookies that we set for better user experience. Then we check if the cookie is fine, if the session ID is set properly. So there are so many other static checks that you can perform when you're doing your in between tests already. You know. So we just uh, uh, talked about API testing. So is, th is there a different format? Like what are the other types of testing that we can perform on APIs? Yeah, well, um, th this, is, uh, this, is, this is very generic, which I think most of them will be knowing, but some for the benefit of everybody who do not know that it's not just a functional testing, you may have to do multiple other forms of testing and checks just to ensure that they are just fit enough for the production relevant systems. Um, one thing that just pops out of mind is, of course, the security tests. It's very important. And many people talk about the OWASP uh, guidelines and other security guidelines. So if you if you talk on a day-to-day -day basis, security testing is not something uh, a scrum team tester usually performs. Most likely, the businesses will be having a tie-up with the external consultancies, or they will ha have a COE, which is a center of excellence team, who performs this deep security test. However, it, it, it's not... Uh, it is not hurtful or harmful if you are already aware and you can put some tests already in place, which is great. But so security is one thing. Um, and then and the performance testing is very important, which pretty much comes within the area of a scrum, scrum team um, tasks when you do an API, which again connects with the race conditions, what uh, Bridges just brought up. Like you have multiple uh, calls coming in with the loads, especially in the retail applications, when you see at the year end or during the Black Friday sales, you have a lot of uh, requests coming in and then website is not able to, how are you going to load balance this? How are you going to test this? How are you going to go back to your logs to check if everything is working just in fine? So there's so many activities that goes behind this uh, performance testing. Uh, and apart from this, something that is very less talked about is data governance. Uh, and I want to bring awareness that when you test your API, now because it's an API economy or API product, API are sold as a product and APIs are made economy. This was this is a new idea, but not so new idea. It's picked up. The market has picked up so much that you can see the whole agenda of that business is to just to provide APIs, develop APIs. You know, that's their product. That's their solution. So uh, this when they do it, there's so many things that goes behind it, like API governance. Example, I sit in EU, so a GDPR laws applies to it. Um, and then uh, legal laws, which is country based and country specific. Usually what happens, these had been abstracted from the scrum teams all this while, but now because the technology is running so fast and the need is so much important that we run this quick, there was a phases every time. In the previous way, there used to be phase, phases, moving from one security to performance and then to data governance and then to legal and then it used to go to the production. But now we cannot spend that amount of time, that luxury of doing everything. So data governance um, is one, of, one other thing which is very important. Mm, uh, yeah, and legal laws, which I said. Yeah, of course. So these are some of the other type of tests which you have to keep your eye towards. Okay, so uh, also how do we uh, ensure that these uh, data are encrypted uh, somewhere? Is there a, you know, um, that we don't share uh, any confidential information? Yes, so um, if I talk at the API level, it's, uh, so firstly, everything starts with the OSI model, which is too deep in its concept. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to touch that. There's like the seven layers and then every layer has something to add. And then there's like encryptions and all those, but 
if I have to restrict only to the API type of a conversations, we talk something about authentication and authorization, right? So authorization is like where you authorize and say, hey, I'm the right person. When somebody comes to your home, if it's your mom, dad, husband, wife, or somebody of your relatives, you know, and they're authorizing themselves through their face and you recognize them, you open the door. Likewise, in your yeah. APIs, either you'll be, you'll be given um, um, a, a barrel tokens or just a basic authentication where you're given a username and a password or a JWT tokens, which can be used to authenticate yourself and authorize yourself. Like I am the right person. So I'm reaching you with this information. And these are, uh, these are very important so that no XYZ person can simply walk in and change the data in your servers. It's, it's a very basic at the basic level. This is some of the, something, uh, secure, uh, application communication, but it can be more than this. So this is how we achieve at the first layer, providing okay. the authentication and authorizations. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, can we see the API testing in action uh, somewhere? Okay, cool. Um, we can do that. And there comes my, uh, yeah. Right, so uh, where did I, the last time I left off in the get APIs, right? So uh, we had, we came across the works that we had, the base URL, and then one thing I didn't mention was about V1. Um, this is optional. You may see in few APIs, you may not. It's simply um, version management. We all know when something is developed, it will be fresh and then there's enhancements, changes going on. So we kind of keep a track for the logging purposes to know what are the different versions which came out. Um, so in that case, you know, you see this versioning V1, V2, V3, you most likely. So if even today, if you look at the Twitter APIs, you get to see this. So this is about the versioning. And in, in my case, this is the first version, the V1 version. Um, and versioning of APIs is also something which test engineers may have to keep an eye towards because for the interoperability and the cross compatibility, let me tell you in one of the ERP organization I was working with. So what we used to have, uh, there was a decoupling. UI can be any of any format on any technology. Backend can be any technology. There were different DBs available. There were fast-paced DBs. There was like slow, usual DBs. You know, uh, there was different ways. And it's up to the customer based on how much money they are interested to shell. They can, you know, choose a front-end, choose a back-end, and then we can make it work, making use of these APIs in between. So when this happens... Uh, not every API is compatible with every DB. So we had different versions. You have to use the right version. So this is what is interoperability when it comes to data um, uh, transfers between the back end to the front end. So this versioning is something also you, you should be aware of and how you can test this interoperability when it comes to different UI, different DB, or different tech stacks, different companies, et cetera. Uh, okay, so I think we touched that. Um, now let's move to the uh, create city. So usually the crude operations, which is create, update, delete. Uh, these operations are very important because you will be dealing and changing the data from the, da from the database servers. So it's all the more important that you authenticate yourself in a right way to perform this action. So in my test plan, I have to create a JWT token, which you can see here. And who will give me this? How will I be aware of? Most, most likely, so many people have this question. It is your development team. Most likely, the person who's creating or developing this uh, should be providing. In fact, it should be part of the documentation, very clearly mentioned how you can create your own token. So in my case, I may have to run uh, this API or run this endpoint in order to get a token. And I will be saving this token securely in one of the variables and then adding it to my header every time I run my API. So this um, makes, makes it more secure when I create something or delete something from the database. So when I going back to the create, which is a post request, if you see, now what happens if I use a get method here? It simply fetches the information. It will not create anything provided if the same endpoint is used to create and also uh, uh, to delete or, or to read. Is it possible? Yes, same endpoints can be reused to perform multiple functions. That's why this method becomes very important for you, where you have to say, I want to create. I want to go to this room and do blah, blah, blah. So that is like, I want to create. But one thing that you have to keep in mind, post does not work empty, just like get. Post works with something called a payload. Payload is, 
is a set of information that you have to pass so that you can save it in your DB, in your database. And there's a specific way in which you have to pass. You simply cannot write something in English like language. I would love to if AI can do that. But right now, we are talking about RESTful APIs. So it has to be within the key and a value format. And my DB or my API has to carry this in this format where a name should be given, which is mostly a string. An airport name should be given. I should provide an abbreviation. And then I have to run a country code as well. So this is called a payload, which you particularly see towards, you know, mostly like put patch post operations because you're trying to change the data, but what data are you changing? It will be part of this payload. Now, when I create, I have to send all mandatory fields in order to create the details in the backend. So when I kind of execute, you see it returns something, me, something back to me. It says, okay, the ID for these details is 54. And then the name, all the data that I have passed is registered in the backend and an ID is given to me. So which means a row or a details is already created. Now, when this is done, let's look at the status. It's not 200 anymore, it's 201. So most likely when you're creating something new and if it is a success, it's most of the cases it's 201 and ideally it should be 201. So if you put a test where you're checking if the response code is 200, it most likely fails. But does that mean it is wrong? No, it's not wrong because anything with 200 is success. However, the, the status code I'm trying to test is, is 201, right? So I have to change it accordingly and just add the verification and then just change it. It's, it's been already been added. And then again, you can either check whether it's not equals, less than, greater than. But with the status code, we will not be entering that. One other thing that you have to keep an, uh, keep in mind and be mindful to do the conversation with your product owner or your architect is the time limit at which you should be receiving the response. Right now, what I'm doing, I'm using a very ideal API, very small API with a small information. Yes, of course it executes. It's a very ideal environment. Tomorrow when you go back to your desk, you execute an API and then you don't see um, getting a result for so many seconds. That's a bug, that's an issue because nobody would like to sit in front of a system, keep loading, loading, loading for an information, right? So uh, it should be pretty quick. Now, what is the baseline measurement for these things? It's something that you have to check with your product team and ask, hey, it's it's taking 3,600 milliseconds. Do you see it is, a, it is a red flag? Should we be working on it? It's a good conversation starter for you so that you can always come back. Most likely it should happen within few milliseconds, uh, no matter how big the data is. And that's the reason why we go with pagination and then so that only chunk of data is passed. And then again, if you make a request based on the pagination, then other set of data is passed. So, um, so it is broken down into different ways, how you fetch the data. So this is one other conversation starter, response time, keep an eye uh, towards it and also ask your product owner about this. Cool. Now let's hit the concept of authorization, right? Um, going back to the API request. Um, when we uh, talk about, okay, so the verification we saw, So I'm running the same response again and again, and I'll creating the same data simply because there is no verification. I can create, I can send the same data and the new data is being added with the new ID being generated all the time. Now, if you look at the authorization, right now I'm not passing anything because it's of course I'm running behind a VPN, it's my own server, it's I'm able to, but in case if this becomes an external API, I wanna make it more secure. Then you remember I created a JWT token. So I simply have to go bear a token and then I have saved it. So I go to the runtime variable. It gives me the set of uh, set of variables that I created and the values it has. I can simply choose and then add it, update my API and then execute all my tests accordingly. So this is a very good practice, especially when you're dealing with uh, post, put um, and more uh, the actions which can change the data most likely, you know. <clears throat> um, and then you have like a modify city API. If you see, one thing I missed in the post or the create is I am also saving some data, which is a port ID. When I create a new data, this ID is generated and this generate, this 
generated ID, I am saving it because all my further tests happens on this newly created entry. And how can I access it based on the ID? So I have to save it somewhere. That's exactly what I'm doing. So when I go here to the outline, I get an option here and then I store it as a variable, which you can see it's saved. And the name I have given is port underscore ID. And I can access this anywhere. When I go back to modify city, because I want to change some details about the airport that I created, and the name has got changed. I go back to the body and I will change something like this. Maybe I'll give a country code as hmm, KYT. I don't know. There is no country that such exists, but I'm giving it. And then KYT International Airport or something. Um, and then you can see the port ID is given because when I change the details, which line of details or whose details should I change? And that should be made pretty clear. And that is given as a part of this. And I can access any stored variable and the runtime variable making use of a dollar sign and then simply access it. And I will be able to run this. Uh, um, yeah, to update. So basically when I run this, it goes to my 55 and then changes the name to Swiss, changes the airport name to KYT International Airport and all of these things. So this is the put, which means you created something, but you, you plan to change, you change. Is that all the tests that we have to do? Is it nothing else? No, there can be more than this. Like, for example, you can think of negative tests. I give a wrong body or I may give a new. Let me go and create something uh, new, like this key doesn't exist, but still I'm giving I'm creating a new like Samya and then I want to give PPP. So this is a negative test you can check. And then country code always takes, let's say abbreviation. Abbreviation always takes string, but what if I send one, two, three, what happens? So these are some of the things that you can try on a day-to-day -day basis when you're testing an API. And yet, no matter what you send, no matter how you send, server should always behave and it should not give you exceptions. So if there is a developer or a programmer who's coming back to you and saying, hey, it's exception, it's okay, because um, that's how we are handling the error. Exceptions are not allowed. It should be handled. Uh, tell them they have to do the try catch statements and they have to hold it and give a proper usable error messages so people can understand and things like that. So this is a, the, the normal day-to-day -day conversation that happens within a team and we, we land up with some unpleasant conversations, right? So, and everybody knows it. Uh, having a proper error messages, dealing with all error conditions, all edge conditions is very important when it comes to an API. And when you test, you can change so many things. You can change the entire format, send it in an XML and see if it's taking. Um, and add more um, columns or a key value pairs and see if it is taking. Reduce the key value pairs and see if it is taking and if it is running. Um, change the data, uh, the type of data that is being passed and check if it is working. So you can keep coming up with so many things. Apart from this, not just running the APIs in, uh, in isolation, you may have to run the APIs uh, in a sequence. Like how you run an end-to-end -end test from login screen to checkout. Likewise, you may have to do the same thing, uh, connecting these APIs, which is making use of sharing these um, variables. You know, I created um, an international airport and I received an ID. So I saved that ID, which has been used here. So this is how I am chaining. I'm linking two APIs to communicate with each other. So, and in that way, I created an entire test plan to do specific thing. Uh, I'll see if this can be removed. This is, this is something which I added now, which is not required. Let me delete that. So you see, I have a set of things where I first create a user login. I add it to my headers. I create... Um, a city, I modify a city, and then ultimately I just want to delete a city so that you know, the entire process is done. So in that case, I can go to my test plan where it is added and I can simply run and do a run. When I do, the whole set of APIs that I created as a part of the test plan will be initiated. And you can see um, the details about that test plan that I have created, how it is working what is happening, and then come back to the dashboard. But even before that, as a test engineer, you will not stop the journey here with API because today is the world of continuous integration. 
and there will be keep, the code keeps changing every day, which means you have to keep checking it every time there's a change in the code. That's the reason why we fall back onto the CI, which is uh, these are CI tools. In my case, this is an example tool that I'm using, which is a GitLab. And again, this is an example setup, what you're seeing. You can either trigger the test from the test sigma workbench, or you can come back to this run pipeline where I have created this, and then I just do the run. And you can see it can, it can run the entire pipeline. You can see the build is being triggered. Something is happening. And then you can see the result, whether it's, it's passed, it's failed, what happened. Um, so you, you see, we started with a single API with an understanding of executing a single API, receiving a response body, going through the response body, understanding the type of tests that we can put, positive, negative, um, all sorts of tests that you can come up on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, you know, uh, bunch it up as a part of your test plan along with your E2E test. You don't have to even hop around looking for one other tool to create this test plan for you and add it as a part of uh, the E2E test along with them. Um, have it in your CI pipeline, trigger it, it gets executed, which is nice. But when you come back to the dashboard, you can beautifully see the run 268 is already executed with all my five test cases. And then you can see what is happening. So you kind of have all this gamut of activities happening when it comes to an API. So this is a full circle. Does it stop here? Of course, no. You go, you check the analytics, you check whether it's working fine or not. If something is failing, you're going to report the bug in Jira or any test management tool that you're using. You chase your developers to get it fixed. You get it fixed and again, you implement the code, the pipeline runs, blah, blah, blah. And this goes on. Now, some of you may have a question how I did this. So for the benefit of that, if you see, this is a, a file that is uh, created which is, um, um, okay, you don't have to remember all of these. If you go to the Test Sigma documentation, you most likely get this. Only two things you may have to change, simply copy paste that. And uh, you may have to update the API key uh, so that you can validate it is you. This again comes under the authorization concept. And then the test plan. My test plan is 190. So I have created as 190. And whenever I execute, that test plan is pulled. Whatever is there as part of the test plan, whether it is E2E test or visual test or API test, everything will be pulled, executed as part of your CI build. And the result is like put back into your dashboard. In case if you have, if you work in, I wouldn't really call it as a service industries, but most likely uh, if you're working with the partners, you're co-creating, you have more teams involved, like a scaled agile teams and more stakeholders who are interested to know what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. You can also download a PDF report and send it to them on a weekly basis or a daily basis, whatever is a, is a cadence. So you can see the view report here and see everything. So that, that's the entire beauty of running the API tests into end. Okay, so I, I gave a lot of information. There was a lot of talking I did. Now I'll take a yeah. little break, maybe if you have any questions. Yes, yes, awesome, awesome demo, uh, Samya. Uh, we do have some uh, questions and also some handpicked questions. Um, Samya, so uh, can you suggest some supportive tools we can check out? Uh, you know, I've heard about Miro. Um, so some schema builders or adjacent validators. Do you, can you suggest some supportive tools? Yeah, you already said it, which is great. Uh, <laughs> it is my work. So um, I'm, I have not personally used Miro or Miro, whatever it is, the okay. pronunciation. Uh, but I make use of um, mind mapping tools to come up with more scenarios. Um, and then I also use JSON validators to beautify and uh, you know, see, because not every JSON response that you receive is small. In my case, it is small. But when you actually go to your testing, testing your applications, it runs in huge uh, huge responses and with the small screens, we will not be able to see. So I most likely use uh, JSON validators. I go there and sometimes I also validate a schema making use of these JSON validators. But again, this is good for static, cannot be adapted along with your test automation. Um, it's, it's good for something that you uh, can use as a handy uh, whenever you need. Okay. That's the question. Yes. And Samia, uh, you know, with the advent of AI and, um, you know, uh, what does the future of API testing look like to you? Uh, future of API testing, how, what, 
how does it look to me it looks bright because like i said it's the stepping stone it's a it's the foundation bedrock of all the innovation that's happening um you mostly like to see that your entire role will be consumed by api slowly because there will be no team which works like okay i may not i don't want api I just want to work i think that's just like few teams and few companies maybe but um mm -hmm. all the present innovations that you see the technological advancements is happening with ai with sorry with api and having a layer of ai on top of that will help you with so many things like predictive analytics uh, predictive analytics and smart documentation it saves your time in doing all those things so the role of api right now if you see uh, with ai is small but this is growing it's not limited um, mm -hmm. we are also seeing we are stumbling there are some loose ends but any innovation starts that way any brand new idea starts that way and then slowly picks up to become a huge massive one more stabler one it's just a matter of time so ai and api together will make a great um okay. a great solutions coming forward one very good example right now what you see is also um uh, in the workbenches it is auto auto correct auto error uh, handling where when we used to code, we had to find out why a field pointer is failing. But now it's autocorrect. It's it scans itself like statically by itself and says, hey, you cannot use this or this does not exist. Maybe you can use and change the code like this, which is more efficient. You know, these type of things that uh, are, you can see it's already taking uh, place in your day-to-day uh, -day work. So it, it's bright. It doesn't stop there. Now I would uh, like to address an important question. Uh, so there's a debate about which is easier, right? API testing or UI testing. I know you may uh, pick a side, but what do you think? Um, uh, like, if I choose so API, uh, UI is gonna slash me up, I guess. But mm -hmm. I'll take a personal personal stand here. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not about favoring one over the other. It's about what makes more sense when we apply and helps us do better testing and more stable testing. So API test first approach is always good. But having said that, today I can sit here at my place and I can say, hey, do API test first. But it's it's not that simple. Many things comes into this picture, like what is your team culture? What is the level of collaboration? What is the skill set that is available? How is your team organized? Um, what, what, is the, what is the complexity of the application you are creating? You have to answer all these questions before you can simply come up with this answer. Okay, let's do API test first. If you're starting something new, it's always nice to do API test first. It's the right place to start. But you have a fully grown application and you have never considered API test and you want to start now. You will be overwhelmed with so many things. And then there will be people, okay, you never did API testing. Why are you doing it now? We are not very really happy about it. We don't have relevant tools. We don't have relevant trainings. And then all, set, all those sort of conversations pans out within a team, which can be sometimes irritating, which we know, and also unpleasant. But... Yeah, so those are the things. Okay, so um, do you adopt an API first strategy um, when you test? So when I go to any team, that would be my first stand that do API test because it's more stable, it's more near to the core, you can find the bug at its source. And once you get a hang of it, they are the sweethearts. They're gonna, they don't change the color uh, like a UI, like a chameleon every every day. Um, oh, I'm I'm being harsh on UI. I shouldn't be, but you know, the more stabler the place is, the more better um, the results would be. So, having said that, I'm not saying ignore UI completely. Please do, but keep all your bet, most part of your bet, towards API, which is good, as it's more near to the source code. Awesome. Thanks for the people who are still with us. Yes. Yes. Uh, a little bit. So we'll just take a couple of uh, questions. So we have a couple of questions on uh, how. Okay, I'll go first with the Bridges question, yeah, which yeah, is sure. complex. Uh, how do you design a strategy to detect and mitigate race conditions in API based architecture during high traffic periods? Thanks, Bridges. And I have no clue. Why I say this? Because I have not worked in a high traffic uh, APIs. Uh, most of my internal APIs, yes, I have been in one of some of the e-commerce uh, websites like my previous company, which was Mila. However, this was not something that we faced or my team had to handle. So if you ask me, do have I personally involved in it? No, I have no clue. But can I come back to you with the answer? Definitely, yes. I have few great people uh, in my team who can always reach out, have a conversation, put something together for you if you're looking for this, and then definitely mail you about this. I hope it's okay. 
I'm sure that should be okay. Let's go to the next one. Yes. Um, okay, so does E2E testing make sense when we do API testing? What? Uh, does end-to-end -end testing make sense when we do API testing? Of course, it does. Now, see, when you say E2E, it's a generic statement. You can do E2E on UI, E2E on API, both the ways you can do E2E, right? So which one are you talking about? Again, we go back to the famous pyramid and unit tests, and system tests and the UI tests and blah, 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 things like that. So the good way would be that if you can interweave a UI with an API, well, how do I mean? So when you trigger, when you, when you trigger a request, let's say I'm filling a form, I key in all the details, I click. So that's a check I'm doing as a part of my UI. But immediately I have to get access to the XHR call that is happening in the backend. And I check if that call is going to the backend. If the call is going to the backend, that's great. That's all I need as part of my front end. And then as a part of my API package, I'm checking if that API in specific is working right or not. So here is the testing handover you're doing from the UI to the middle layer and then an elaborate middle layer test, which, which takes place. So it has to be interwoven. It cannot be just UI, just API. This is how you build the synergy between the UI and API test. Um, do we need to remember the codes, uh, Samya? We discussed, we did touch upon this, but uh, mm -hmm. the code, for example, 200, uh, do we need to remember all the codes? If you're a first time or a newbie, like I said, you may always have to go back to the documentation, but like I said, anything starts with 100 is an information. Anything starts with 200 is most likely a success. Anything starts with 400 is an error. So just by looking at it, you can gauge whether it's an error or is it a success. And now if you want to know more details about it, let's say something about 404 and you don't know, then go back to the documentation to read about it. A few times you do this, by third or fourth time, you already know, okay, what 404 means, what 302 means, what 301 means, you know? So yeah, that would be my answer. Awesome. Um, there's just one question about API fuzzing. Um, so if I understand it right, usually API fuzzers are used to generate some um, prompts and responses uh, and to check. But again, I have not done it personally. So again, I wouldn't call myself who knows something. I may blabber to answer your question, but I have a very high level idea about it. Um, sorry, I may not be of very helpful to you, but I'll take a note of that. It's API fuzzers. Thanks for the awesome. question and also a learning yes. for me. Sure, sure. Um, any okay? Any like resources you can suggest, Samya, uh, to for uh, you know to get started with API testing? Uh, uh, well, there are so many. Um, I always turn into YouTube to look at people. There's okay. so many free content coming in. Um, but if you're if you're more like me, I am a book person, so I invest in a book. I take a book, I read it, and I do the exercises it's given in. That's how I started with the RPC coding uh, back then. Um, but if if you're more like a video person, I always suggest go for YouTube videos, which is free, or Udemy videos, which is available at a very low, low cost. Or some communities also have uh, created videos, uh, which is uh, just good content, and then you can lean back on that. If you have a very good relationship with your developers or a programming team, uh, go back to them, sit with them, learn from them. No, that's how I learned it. So there are many ways. Just have to see what works with you easier. Okay. Uh, one question for you, uh, Samir, which is, does input request parameters have to be tested one by one, just like we do some field validation for you? With regards to test sigma, yes. Okay. There are tools which allows you to do uh, in, in chain or in loop. Okay. Uh, hey, can I add to that, Soumya? Yes. Uh, okay, sure. Yes. Himani, please yeah. take it. Hey, hi. Oh, just uh, to give an introduction, Himani is the product uh, manager at Tessic. Go ahead, Himani. All right, thanks. Uh, to add to that, Soumya, we do support chaining your APIs and you know parameterizing them, supporting data-driven testing. So at any point of time, let's say you have a uh, lots of data, you have hundreds of fields you want to validate in your API. At any point of time, you can attach your data to the API and then that API will run for all of those hundred uh, data uh, set that you have created at your end. Uh, also, you can provide uh, add some filters to it, wherein let's say you just want to um, loop over the data 
where city name is Delhi. So that sort of filters are also available. Uh, for yeah. test data, we have that support readily available in our system. For complex operation that you want to perform and some operations that are not really available in our system, for that we have a add-on support. So any point of time you feel, okay, I need this functionality, but that is not available right now. Although our team is very responsive and is able to uh, cater to any requirement that are out there, but for quick fix, the add-on is the way to go. Yeah. So there are a couple of questions regarding Test Sigma versus Postman. So um, if I think that would get elaborate, right? So um, do you want to take it now, Himani, or do do we can we get back to this question on email? Uh, sorry, which question? Uh, the postman versus text. Oh postman. yeah, yeah. The the most asked question. I, I'll be yes. happy to answer that. Okay. So um, all right. Basically, I uh, you just need to understand that test sigma is a. Uh, in a sort of workspace wherein you have all the capabilities available, we are a test automation environment. So you can perform all your end-to-end -end testing needs here. Now the world doesn't start and end at API testing, right? API testing is just one module that is available. So one is you can sim very easily create your end-to-end -end tests here. You can you know create an order from API and then go on to the UI check if that order is available or not. So all of that you can perform in single click with no need to understand any code or no need to learn what kind of uh, architecture is written at the back end. So uh, to take some examples in API testing specifically in that module, uh, you don't need to understand how to write JavaScript code to add assertions, it, it's a single select and click operation. You select which verification you want to add, you add it, and then you can also parameterize all your uh, validations, all your, uh, basically, like we were talking about data driven, right? So all of that is single click and assert. So that is one advantage. Another thing that I talked about is end-to-end -end testing, right? You can uh, create end-to-end -end tests. You can integrate uh, those with CI/CD pipeline, and nothing takes more than five minutes doing that in uh, Test Sigma. The another major requirement that we came across was basically grouping some tests together and reusing them. Uh, so that concept is very well handled in Test Sigma. You can create step groups out of API test or any end-to-end -end test you have and use it anywhere in your Test Sigma project. So these are some of the uh, areas wherein we excel. But to understand a little more about it, our team can reach out to you separately on email or maybe you can set up a demo with us to get more understanding into it. And uh, let's wind up. Uh, I know it's uh, quite late already. Um, so, uh, before we go, um, we want to uh, thank Saumya, Saumya Sridharamurthy, everyone, and uh, you can find her uh, Twitter handle, Saumya. Cool. Cheers. Thanks for sticking with us and uh, hopefully to see you back in another webinar. Yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. Ciao, ciao. See you in the next one, everyone. Bye.